Simona Fisher is a designer with MSR who works on new and adaptive reuse designs at a variety of scales. She is an organizer of local design practitioners who are passionate about sustainability, and she conducts research, studies systems theory, and seeks collaborators in support of transforming architectural practice. Please join me in welcoming Simona. Good morning. So with me today are four colleagues from four different offices that work on a variety of different project typologies from residential to commercial to industrial to institutional with staff numbers ranging from three to over 150 people. And despite these different starting places, all four firms have signed on to the 2030 challenge and subsequently joined the AIA 2030 commitment. Uh, to clarify, the 2030 challenge was first issued in 2006 by Ed Mezria and Architecture 2030, and that was the letter of intent that a lot of architecture firms signed on to. The AIA 2030 commitment is the set of tools, it's the evolution, it's the set of tools and resources, it's the actual framework that we all report into. So these four office leaders are gathering and reporting uh, modeled energy use data into the national reporting framework every year. And they're reporting transparently, despite the fact that as of 2018, three out of four of us are not meeting the challenge. Shh, don't what? tell us. <laughs> Although, one of us is hitting the target and beyond. The goal of which, as of 2016, is now a 70% reduction in energy use intensity across our entire project portfolios over a standardized national baseline for each building type. So who do some of us think we are standing up here and talking to you today about this? Well, the truth is we're out of time. According to this fall's IPCC report, we may now have about 12 years to avert disastrous levels of oceanic warming, the effects of which we're already experiencing. And we know that buildings are 40% of the greenhouse, the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are causing the warming. The other bit of truth is that it's taking a lot of work to inch our numbers down, which means that if I wait until I'm succeeding to share strategies with you and with the rest of the industry. And if you wait until you think you can succeed to even begin measuring and reporting, then you and I will both have failed to do our best. So we are here today to share how we've been tackling the challenge, uh, what it's taken to get where we are, and also what we're learning and how the 2030 challenge is inspiring our practice. How many of you are either owners or members of firms that have signed on to the 2030 commitment? So maybe about 15? Uh, really? 25% I would say? Half? I don't know. Uh, how many of those who raised their hands were actually able to report data in 2018 here? Great. So I'd like to introduce my colleagues. Uh, Jesse Turk of BWBR will talk about the broader context of the 2030 commitment and how his firm is approaching it. Amber Sousen of Alliance will talk about the nuts and bolts and cover the annual process and the other elements of meeting the commitment. Chris Wingate of MSR will talk about energy modeling and also how the 2030 commitment can influence a firm's culture. And Carly Colson of Colson will speak about lessons learned and specific design approaches from a firm that is meeting the challenge. Jesse, we'll start with you. Thank you, Simona. All right. So 
as Simona mentioned, I'm a project manager with BWBR, and today I'll just be sharing what our office does. Um, so backing up a little bit, why do we care? And for us, I mean, this is our home. That's the main reason we care. We know climate change is real, contrary to what you may hear periodically on uh, various news outlets. And this is our home, there's no planet B. And you may have seen graphs similar to this uh, over time, but I think it's worth seeing them again. The one on the left shows the CO2 concentration uh, from the year zero, and you can tell where the Industrial Revolution started. And then on the right, you can see how the temperature correlates to CO2 concentrations. And then zooming in just to the Industrial Revolution, you can, or since the Industrial Revolution, you can see how temperature has increased, and especially on the right, the last few years have increased dramatically. And as Simona mentioned, the Architecture 2030 and the 2030 Challenge was started uh, a little over a decade ago, and the, the revelation that they shared with the profession was that buildings are roughly half of the U.S. energy con consumption. It's a little lower than that globally, um, but also three quarters of the electricity use in the country is goes into buildings. And again, the targets we're trying to hit today, we're shooting for a 70% reduction from average. And AIA National also believes that climate change is real and we can be part of the solution. So that's why we joined the AIA 2030 commitment and we signed up on Earth Day in 2014 we had a staff meeting, big party, had a cake. Um, then, the, then the work started. So you know, where do we start? We signed up for this uh, great aspirational goal. Uh, one of the things you have to do a sustainability action plan. This is our view of that. Um, we kept it very simple, one page, bulleted list, so it would be easy to digest, not too scary. And then we just jumped into doing things. Part of it, you have to tackle office initiatives. And this is our office. Um, it's a lead silver through the existing building operation and maintenance program. And about the same time, the building was going through recertification. And they were looking at different office initiatives. Kincaid's, the restaurant on the main floor in our building, was doing, looking at starting composting. And we said, you know, hey, can we get in on that as a trial? Um, which, after some internal discussion, we got approval to try it, and contrary to the naysayers in the office, there's been really no issues with smells or flies or anything like that. It's just been a, a, great, a great thing in the office, as well as expanding our education on recycling, and then also tracking uh, at all our printers, the prints that didn't get picked up, and reporting that at staff meetings as well. And then also getting more diligent about returning our material samples because that was throwing off the building's waste weight calculations because concrete samples are heavy. <laughs> uh, we also looked at uh, commuting methods through uh, the office now has an hour car subscription to take to meetings and things like that, as well as bus passes and that sort of thing. And then we had to dive into building energy use reporting. And how we measure is Predicted energy use intensity, you can think of it as miles per gallon in the car. It's KBTUs per square foot. And then we had to start actually collecting data. And this is incredibly sexy graphic. Um, it's, it really comes down to just nuts and bolts of getting numbers and filling them in boxes. And again, none of this is rocket science. Um, I essentially meet with all the project managers in the office in February-ish and run through their lists of projects to see if they qualify for reporting. And then we fill in you know, very technical things like project name, location, square footage, and then uh, getting into the energy data that they either have uh, from energy modeling or they don't, and then we use uh, code, code default numbers. And then from there, you plug it into the AIA's Design Data Exchange, or DDX, which each project gets a, a page like this that you just fill the numbers into the, the boxes. And then it rolls up into a, a firm summary that you can 
slice and dice by year or um, different categories. And then you get a, a graphics on your report of how the firm is doing. And again, you can do it by year, the total years of reporting, uh, as well as other different research things. So it's, it's a really cool tool that's, re again, really easy to use. So one thing we struggled with when we were starting is what's an average building? Um, so what uh, we realized, and uh, a few of the smart folks at the White Group and others essentially said that the baseline is roughly an ASHRAE 90.1 1989 building code. So that's, that's the average where you start. So this graphic slices it into the four years that we've been reporting. And then the 2014 goal was 60% reduction, and then it went to 70%. And as the building codes have gotten more stringent, there's code equivalencies of what the reduction is. Currently in Minnesota, we're about a 42% reduction. So you think 70%, I can never hit that. Well, as long as you're not breaking the law, you're already at 42%. So you're more than halfway there. And one of the things that we learned after the first year of reporting was buildings that had energy modeling that either through EDA or B3 or that kind of thing, we weren't capturing all the actual savings, so we had to come up with formulas to get us back to the 1989 baseline. And these formulas, you're not going to be able to get right now, but it'll be available in the, the slides after the convention, or you can email me and I can send you those formulas. Um, and then this is how our buildings fall in the, the percentage reductions. So you can see there's a few of them that are hitting the targets. And the, the lighter colored dots are ones that are required to meet the targets through B3 and SB 2030. And then the blue dots are a few projects that had uh, clients that were really pushing it or other, uh, other things driving the project. So it just shows that we can do it. We can meet the targets. Um, but the other thing is, a lot of times we don't. So you can see the clusters of dots that hover roughly around the code lines. And that's the reality, that a lot of the projects, we aren't hitting it. Um, or we don't have energy modeling to show. And if you don't have energy modeling, you just report the code minimum. And then you know, we, we started looking at, well, how do we compare to other firms in the country? So as I said, this was the fourth year we've reported. So as part of our yearly data collection and sharing with the office uh, with graphics, I developed this infographic that's about 12 feet long and pinned up in our lobby so everybody can see it, as well as you know, sharing it online and stuff. But this breaks down all of the all of the numbers that we've collected uh, in the four years. So this is our annual energy reduction. And you can see we're you know, in the mid to upper 40s. Um, last year was a, a little bit of a down year for a variety of reasons. Um, and then the teal bar shows where the national average is, which the national report for 2017 just came out yesterday. So we haven't plugged that data in yet. And then this just shows how our different market segments compare. Some markets are harder, some are easier, um, but it, it's important to try and do your best on all the projects. And then our first four years of reporting, just showing the, the teal bar is the number of square footage that we've reported, and then the number of total projects that represents. The orange is the amount of modeled, energy modeled square footage, and then the the lighter bar is the square footage that's actually compliant and meeting the target. So you can see, you know, like all of your firms, our workload goes up and down and uh, fluctuates year to year. And then uh, this year I did another summary that I did after the first year as well, where we, we broke down the data by our different market segments to see how they compare the number of projects, total square footage, and then I also did the same breakout for the principals in charge of projects, project managers, and design leaders, and sent that out to the, the list of people just to see where they fall on the list. And it primarily wasn't meant to shame people, but just meant to give them data. And it's no different than how we 
how we track our project profitability or other, other things like that, but just sharing the data so people can improve uh, when they need to. And then also with the infographic, we tried to promote and share the top projects for each of the four years, as well as the top, top performing team members. And again, this is on the, the infographic, so people can see who's doing well, and hopefully it's a little bit of inspiration to try harder and meet the goals on the projects. And then we started seeing uh, patterns of what all the really high performing projects have in common. They all used energy modeling, most of them took advantage of either a, a B3 or energy design assistance, but most importantly, they were talking about energy use during design instead of, you know, that's priority number 12 on a top 10 list. Uh, a little bit of bad news, things are gonna get harder. Um, so this is a graphic I showed you a few minutes ago. Next energy code in Minnesota is going to 50%, and that's probably in the next year or so that'll be coming online. And then in a little over a year, the 2030 target is going to be jumping to 80%, which, as you can see, none of our dots are even very close to the 80% line. So we're going to have to get better. And the question is, how do we improve? Because we know we have to. So one of the things is set your EUI target early. And we have a project initiation meeting early in schematics where myself and a few others meet with project teams. and review the projects, help them set goals, and try and identify opportunities that they can take advantage of. And then use the Energy Star Portfolio Manager to set targets, which again is a relatively easy tool. 10 minutes or so you can have a, a loose target for your project. Use a utility sponsored program if you can. And again, there's Excel Energy is probably the most well known, um, but there's a variety of other utilities that have it, and usually they're run by the white group. Most of the time the design team gets paid to go to meetings and coordinate things. And our, our friends at the white group are continuing to market this around the country, so the number of utilities is only going to be growing. Doing energy modeling early and often, you've probably seen variations on this curve that your ability to affect change in the building happens early. And so if you wait until you're into DDs or CDs, you've missed probably 80% of the opportunity to impact the building. And then just comparing our energy modeling percentages and we're the colored bars and the national averages and the, the teal. And as you can see last year, we were down a little bit with our energy modeling. But one thing we have realized over the four years that the projects that do energy modeling perform about 20% better than those that don't which is, can be a key selling point to owners that are reluctant to pay extra for energy modeling that we now have more solid data to back up why they should be doing it. Another tool that you maybe have heard of, the 2030 palette was pulled together by Architecture 2030 and it's sort of a pattern language that starts at the macro scale where you can pick an, an area that's of concern in your design and then you can dive into it, and it goes, like I said, from the macro to the micro. And so, for example, if you dive into the form for daylighting, there's project examples and resources. And then uh, going in further, there's different strategies of how you can do that. And then uh, a little bonus material for you this morning, just a reward for getting up, getting here by 8.30. Uh, you probably all heard of the Paris Climate Agreement that was agreed to three years ago. You're probably also aware of Will Steger, a world famous Minnesota polar explorer. Uh, he started the Climate Generation Organization a little over a decade ago, and they've been sending delegations to the uh, COP proceedings several times over the last few years. And this year it's in Katowice, Poland, which it uh, is the first year that the countries will be actually getting more serious and more real about what they're doing and what they have done to try and meet their commitments that they made in Paris. Uh, so it'll be a, they're, they're likening it to Paris 2.0. Um, that starts December 3rd and runs through the 14th. Um, 
And then I was lucky enough to be selected to be one of their delegates going there. Um, so if you're interested in following their uh, window into COP24, uh, you can either jot down that really long uh, URL there or just Google search climate generation COP24 and then it gives you uh, information and links to follow follow our progress. So it'll be um, myself, a representative from Fig and Faro, the restaurant in Minneapolis, uh, Target and Best Buy. So we'll be there for about a week uh, sending back daily blogs. Um, I'm hosting a webinar on the 10th from 1 to 1.30 central time. Um, I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about yet, but I'll figure that out before 1 o'clock on that day. Um, but if you want more information on this, uh, you can either email me or uh, follow me on Twitter. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amber. So we've heard why this is important. Let's talk about how. How do you really do this? How do you move from believing this is important to taking action? Or at least I will be able to tell you how we've done so at Alliance. Alliance has a green team. Um, it's a pretty standard thing for a lot of firms to have. At Alliance, our green team focuses on education, operations, tools and strategies to help our designers do better and our firm operate better. So to sign up for the 2030 commitment, um, Alliance had signed up for the challenge in 2010. In 2011, we said, let's raise our game. Let's take this firm philosophy of embracing sustainability and a desire to practice data-driven design decision-making and let's codify that through signing up for the 2030 commitment. So because of that natural alignment with firm philosophy, it was really a no-brainer and there was no um, contention when we brought this um, from the green team up to firm leadership. So you write a letter and you say, hey, we want in. And then, ta-da, you're there. You're part of the directory of firms. So all of the firms who are 2030 commitment signatories are listed on this website. Right now, Minnesota has 21 firms. I would love to see that number doubled when I see you back here next year. So I hope that we will uh, convince you that this is a manageable and feasible and necessary commitment for your firms to take on as well. So after you've signed on, what comes next? We have to make a plan for how we're going to get there. And the first step is to create a sustainability action plan. So this is one of the requirements of signing on to the commitment. And this plan can be very simple, like the one pager that you saw in Jesse's slides. Um, ours is a little more in depth. But it's got six main elements. And the, as I kind of talk through these elements, they're really great, these six different elements, because they force you to think outside of just typical sustainability and start talking about operations and practice and where are you going? What is your firm's philosophy? And how are you going to bring that forward into the future? So the first element is your firm commitment. So this is generally drawn straight from your commitment letter, but it's just reaffirming your firm's philosophy and intention to meet the goals of the 2030 commitment. Next up is the design approach. Really, what are the goals you're going to set for your own practice in how to meet these um, challenges? Evaluation and reporting. Again, setting internal goals and establishing those practices, because otherwise, this could totally overwhelm you. Once you see that image of the whole globe out there and say, wow, I'm responsible for tackling all of that? No, you set some quick goals and you say, these are the manageable pieces at each stage of the design process that we are going to hold ourselves accountable for. Outreach and advocacy. How are you going to be an ambassador to your firm, to the practice, and to your community through signing on to the 2030 commitment? So setting some goals for yourself, some metrics to uh, work towards. Training and education. 
various ways that this can be shaped. Um, at Alliance, we set a goal that all of our design professionals would become lead GA, and we also set a target of providing more targeted lunch and learns um, opportunities for sustainable education, both from outside experts and tapping into the expertise we already have within the firm. Operations and outlook. Here's where you can start talking about composting and recycling and thinking about video conferencing rather than hopping on a plane to go meet your clients in person. So these sorts of goals are also important to set in the sustainability action plan. So coming out of establishing the action plan, we realized that our green team wasn't quite doing the same thing that our 2030 commitment needed us to do. So we broke apart and created a 2030 team. And so you can see their friendly faces up there. And we also established studio champions, because this group of four people is not going to be able to tackle all of the information gathering needed for a firm of over 100 people. So we also have studio champions who help each of the PAs and PMs along the way to gather that required data. And then that blank page is staring you in the face of gathering that project data. And that sounds really overwhelming. And oh my gosh, how do I do that? We do a lot of projects every year. Let me break it down. It's not that bad, and you can do it. Sometimes it takes a little friendly competition. We did have a little interest studio competition here to try to encourage PAs and PMs to proactively log their data, get it in our system ahead of time so that people like me don't have to come tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, where's your data? Every February. But really, we, uh, we use Dell Tech Vision, which is uh, accounting, time management, do lots of things sort of software I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. So at Alliance, our approach was to program in a tab for project data looking at the 2030 commitment in particular. So anybody on a team can log in and start tracking that data. What are your predicted energy use intensity targets that you're aiming for? What's your lighting power density? And all the typical you know, project location, zip code, energy code, et cetera. Um, tracking this data is um, an annual endeavor, and a lot of you know projects end sometimes before we're getting to that push to start tracking data. So I do need to give a shout out to all the consultants in the room who are so wonderful about supporting the firms who are reporting data in stepping back up, stepping to the plate, and saying, yep, our lighting power density is this, our predicted energy use intensity is this. So thank you, consultants, for your role in helping firms uh, track data for the 2030 commitment as well. So our team looks at, the 2030 team takes a look at all of the projects that we've built to in a given year, and you can see there's a few empty holes. There's never been a year where all of that data is nicely filled in. So we do have a little follow-up with PAs and PMs, and that's where the studio champions come in, and they will help shepherd people through the process of getting the appropriate data and then our team verifies it, and it gets uploaded into the design data exchange. So there's two ways you can do this. You can, tr well, there's multiple ways. There's lots of ways. There's at least four different ways right up here. Um, you can track your data directly in the design data exchange. You can track it in an outside software, which is what Alliance is doing. We're tracking it within Vision. You can use an Excel spreadsheet like BWBR is doing. You can do whatever works for you. So it, at our firm, we're tracking an outside source and it has to get uploaded into the DDX and that can happen via a bulk upload, that can happen via just manual data entry, whatever works for you. There's lots of paths to success. So here's our results. Right now Alliance is tracking just slightly below the national average and let me tell you why. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I would love to be up at that 70% reduction, but we're not there. And so here's where we've come from. We track every single eligible project. We don't limit it to only projects over 10,000 square feet or 20,000 square feet. We're tracking everything that's eligible. 
So that means that it might be a 200 square foot retail renovation, but it has lighting impact. So we got to track that lighting power density. So those sorts of smaller projects don't often get the benefit of energy modeling. I know Jesse's already talked about energy modeling, but I'm going to hit it again because it is so important to energy model your projects. Um, so if you don't get the energy modeling done, you can only claim code. That's the best you can do. So energy model your projects. So we know we can do it because on projects that are part of LEED or are part of the B3 programs where energy modeling is expected and meeting these goals is expected, we can do it. We get there. Um, so it's, it's that swing between a lot of small projects that aren't modeled and a few big ones that are, it starts to just kind of skew the numbers in ways that don't look very good on an overall average. But um, where we are succeeding greatly um, is in lighting power density. The widespread adoption of LED fixtures has made the 25% reduction target, in my opinion, kind of absurd. It should be set much higher um, to really push us to think very carefully and strategically about our lighting choices in our projects. So that should be an easy one for to pat yourselves on the back on once you join. Um, so beyond the data, I'm just going to touch on a couple of things that have been inspired at Alliance through our signature, signing on to the 2030 commitment. Um, energy modeling, projects are doing 15 to 20 percent better on a national average if they're energy modeled. So take advantage of tools like Sapphira that will allow you to do early conceptual comparative energy modeling. Um, I'd also like to talk about our SWAT process. It has nothing to do with weapons. It is specialized wisdom and training. So these are teams at Alliance that drop into projects, even if they're not part of that project team, to offer expertise along the way. Quick project example, um, the food court at MSP Terminal 1. You can do these sorts of studies in SketchUp to understand what are the impacts of this west-facing glazing, adding vertical fins. But the SWAT team was able to come in and quantify that add some real data to the design decision-making process so that these fins could be sized appropriately to make a beautiful space become also a comfortable space for all of the users in the future. And with that, I hope you will join us in adopting the challenge. And I'll leave you with this link and hand it over to Chris. All right. So you've heard why it's important to join the AIA 2030 commitment. Uh, you now understand what it takes to get there, what you are actually signing on for. And we've also started to talk about the fact that there are many ways that you can tackle these pretty, um, a, a small list of things that you actually need to do. So I'd like to talk about how you can actually look to your own firm culture to help make those decisions on how you engage with the 2030 commitment and leave yourself open for the possibility that signing on to this can be extremely generative and can influence your firm culture moving forward. Um, I'd like to do that by looking at first, why did we sign on to the AIA 2030 commitment? And grab this. Um, so, you know, we're telling the story today, it's 2018, but uh, I'm actually gonna reverse back to 2007. And when we first started talking about the 2030 challenge at MSR, we also started looking back at our design philosophy. Um, one of those philosophies is creating architecture of enduring, enduring value. Um, what does that mean? We believe in making architecture that is the art of making places that are beautiful, well-built, functional, of their time and place, and respected by the community. When we really started to think about what sustainability and energy performance could mean in the context of how we already talked about architecture, we pulled apart this phrase of their time and unpacked that. And if we are making architecture of its time, it better well respond to the challenges of that time, and that is uh, global warming currently. So why is this linguistic jujitsu important? For us, this meant that we were looking for ways to address climate change and energy modeling and performance 
always in a way that would bring it in dialogue with all of the normal, typical architectural design drivers uh, that we go after. So we signed on to the 2030 challenge. Two years later, we joined the AIA 2030 commitment. And that gave us a specific goal towards quite a heck of an improvement, which is this carbon neutral, de delivering carbon neutral buildings by 2030. Uh, as we've kind of hinted at, what comes next is a big question mark. So how do we get there? Well, uh, we again looked at our firm values, our philosophy, and something that guides our office culture philosophy is an idea of self-renewing practice. Uh, to illustrate this, uh, our firm is, is about 60 folks right now, get 60 dots up there. Um, so we try to continuously look for ways of engaging new ideas uh, to inspire um, us, to make it a fun, wonderful place to work and push our work forward. Um, one way we do this is by partnering with academia. So our orange MSR dots, uh, there's a pretty healthy tradition of teaching at the University of Minnesota and at other colleges. And there's a pretty robust internship program where students join our office. Uh, when we were joining the AAA 2030 commitment, we had an opportunity to take this a step farther. So at the time at the University of Minnesota, this Master of Research Practices program was being introduced. And that all of a sudden gave a framework for four firm leaders to work with one graduate student researcher under the guidance of an academic uh, faculty member, uh, all working towards a singular research project. Uh, MSR chose the project, uh, let's develop an energy modeling methodology. The hope there is that this team could come together, develop something, and that knowledge would uh, sort of through osmosis filter through the rest of the firm. Um, how that specifically happened is we took that blue dot, that research student, um, I was lucky enough to be that blue dot, and that blue dot was, uh, became part of the professional working world and was hired by MSR. Um, how we actually then spread this knowledge through the rest of the firm, I think is an extension of firm values again. So for us, it's important that we engage in actually one-on-one -on -one training where we look at the different project teams that are operating at any given time, and if there is a need, um, if there isn't yet someone that uh, has engaged in energy modeling, we sit down, it takes about four to eight hours to go through the software now, it's pretty easy to use, because the hope is that every project team at any given time should have a designer who is doing energy modeling. This is early phase energy modeling, and I'll get a little more into that in a little bit, but this approach says, well, we're not going to have just a specific set of people that come in for a day or two in a project and give you feedback. We're not going to completely rely on consultants. This also means that we are going to work with consultants. It's just that as we train more people in this way of working and way of thinking, the same hands that are doing initial sketches are the same hands that understand and are also developing um, graphics and analysis. So they enter into dialogue with one another. Um, so how has this actually played out? So over the last four years, I looked at our energy modeling statistics. Um, we currently share five active software licenses for this early phase energy modeling program. We've had 25 people um, engage with the program over four years. Currently, there's 16 active users, and we've ran 186 projects through this early phase analysis software. Um, so what is this? What does this look like? And why do I keep saying early phase energy analysis? Again, it goes back to this philosophy that if we go back to the Vitruvian Triangle, let's go way back, talk about firmness, commodity, and delight. Think, talking about firmness and your structure and materiality and the construction systems that go in your building, there is a natural extension when you just talk about energy performance. These uh, decisions can be influenced by analysis. When we're talking about delight, beauty, uh, these are invisible characteristics. So if we are already talking about how light meets a material, we can certainly ask how light can be looked at through the foot candles or through glare and have a dialogue between these two worlds. 
To be more specific about it, we are fighting against the way we are traditionally thought, uh, taught in education, which is the scientific method of deductive reasoning or inductive reasoning. These are linear thought processes. We all get to a point in a design studio where we're throwing this massive curveball of this design process that is anything but linear. We are saying these are not in opposition. Rather, we can still engage in our fun curly cues. It's just at certain moments, we are going to ask those to become measured against specific baselines. If you do that enough, you actually gain this accumulated knowledge. So your rules of thumb become um, more intelligent, more uh, well-tuned to the climates you're working in, to the project types you're doing, and the next project you start is actually going to start on a better foot than it would have previously. Um, there are lots of energy modeling tools out there, um, but they all run on the basic seven inputs of climate data, construction types, building form, occupancy types, et cetera, et cetera. I think it is helpful to know and to talk about the fact that those of us in this room that are architects, we care dearly about the top three, about climate information, construction types, and building form. Things like building systems and system schedules, we can rely on consultants for that. Um, we also need to make this information beautiful if it's going to have an impact. So here are some examples of a uh, 40,000 square foot library that we were looking at. And what you see is a lot of graphic effort to take daylight analysis and energy analysis. And the hope is that we um, develop a way of working that when we are making uh, design massing moves, when we are looking at iteration, this starts to operate like a bellows to a fire. So as we change something, we directly see the impact on the daylight analysis and on the metrics of energy performance. These little orange bars that are jumping around in this middle graphic at the bottom, this is solar heat gain. And you can see its impact um, of the massing on solar heat gain when you work like this. Uh, you can also, besides massing, you can also really start to tune your decisions about construction types, uh, insulation levels. And these are really easy to do. Each one of these graphics that you can see but certainly can't read from there, really all this is is you say, hey, I want to look at a wall. I want to study R value from 15 to 60. You hit a button, and 30 seconds later, you have the energy curve, which is the yellow guy, on how that one isolated uh, element impacts energy in your project. So you can inform these decisions quickly and efficiently. So now when you come out with that uh, first schematic rendering, it's been in dialogue with analysis. This came uh, kind of, something that came out of this was this uh, set of maybe four commandments. Um, so if we're gonna go after early design analysis and develop ways of working, they better engender a connection to and an understanding of an environmental issue. They certainly need to be easy to use. We know that our time is stretched every single which way, and if you ask someone to adopt a new tool or way of working, it needs to be feasible that they can actually do that. Uh, the uh, methodologies that we develop should always utilize industry standard metrics. This is what the AIA 2030 commitment gives you for energy modeling. Um, and it should produce trusted, but also graphically compelling results. So we did this energy modeling methodology in 2011, and we started reporting our performance in 2012. Um, and here is a snapshot of our performance um, over the last six years. Um, as has been stated, we are all, the uh, 2030 commitment targets are the black bars in this. Um, so we've hovered very close. We uh, got over the hurdle once, um, and we are, um, you know, pretty reliably um, sitting close to it, but yet slightly underneath it. But I want to talk about um, our reporting process quickly. Um, because we believe in um, teaching individuals um, the tools with which they can energy model projects. Uh, we also rely on individual project managers to report the results. This is not that dissimilar from what you've heard. Um, so I'm actually just gonna kind of speed up through this process. Um, but in three months, we go through the same idea where one person sends out an email 
to all project managers, we then filter out projects that are not applicable to be reported to the 2030 challenge. We upload our information to that same uh, 2030 commitment to DDX exchanged server. Uh, most importantly, we then um, write an email and really key in everyone on how we perform that year. We put it in context of everything that you've actually seen up here, um, how we've done in the past, how we're doing now, um, how that compares um, to the rest of the reportees and industry um, averages. So if that is why we joined the 2030 commitment and how it's helped to get us to 2018, how can this help push us forward? Well, the same setup of extension of our firm values when we were first looking at an idea of energy performance and how it integrates with architecture can be broadened to starting to look at sustainability topics that sit outside of and in addition to energy performance. When we look at looking for ways of working and tools and commitments that set a specific goal towards significant improvement, we can again broaden the scope, start to look at things like the AIA coat program or the living building challenge. And when we talked about looking for ways of working that give us opportunities to measure and track progress, well, there's a whole lot of topics that we can take on, including embodied energy, life cycle assessment, water use, and on and on. And I'm happy to say that the 2030 commitment has been a massive springboard to do exactly that. So if we joined the 2030 challenge in 20, uh, 2009, we started reporting on our energy performance in 2012, we have continued to broaden the scope. Uh, all these uh, blue dots um, are um, the projects that we've done working with the University of Minnesota and this Masters of Research Practices program. Uh, so we've looked at life cycle analysis and embodied energy. Uh, we looked at last year um, what post-occupancy research can mean to a project and how we close this feedback loop between all of these predictive ways of measuring performance and following up on how these actually perform in the world. So I just want to talk about one of those briefly and how they can um, come again into dialogue with the 2030 commitment. Uh, so this is life cycle analysis and embodied energy. Uh, this is a current research project that we are doing. Again, the guidelines for this project in terms of methodology are the exact same outcomes that came out of our energy modeling methodology. So when you are looking at a specific project and trying to decide, you know, do we use wood or steel, st steel structure? What does that mean? For us, it's important to give larger context to that. So if we can compare structural systems, we can also look at how that embodied energy in this blue and the red pieces of the pie can actually be put in dialogue with operating energy and this shows energy flows in a building over 60 years. So we understand how all of these decisions are nested. If we graph that another way, we have been talking about operating energy for the majority of this presentation. That is the slope on these bars. And if you um, have a sort of better energy performance, you're gonna have a lower energy slope. This is the lifespan of a building from zero to 60 years. And this initial vertical thrust, that line there, that's the amount of embodied energy that was in uh, this project. At a snapshot, it looks like there's a whole lot more operational energy than embodied energy in a project. But if we shrink our time span and look at 2030 and back up a whole bunch of years, all of a sudden, the choices that we're making about embodied energy are actually very important if we stop our graph at 2030. So this has led to continuously questioning and looking for these opportunities to engage design thinking with analysis methodology. We are now at a point where we are trying to look back and collect all of these disparate efforts. 
and see what that can mean for our firm and what that can mean for architecture. We are starting to aggressively, again, use an AIA program, the AIA Coat Top 10, as a way to systematically go through many different aspects of sustainability in addition to energy. And we are starting to create our next strategic vision, which is to be a leading design firm that achieves inspiring generative impacts across the board on every project by 2030. And with that, I will hand it over. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to share. Um, my narrative is a little bit different in scale um, and the path that I took. Um, so I want to start with the why. We've all talked about it a little bit, but I think amongst all of our spreadsheets and data that we really need to emphasize the emotional, the emotional reasons that we make a commitment and keep commitments. So for me, um, I'm really fortunate that I get to live in Duluth. And um, I'm, I'm in love with the natural world. Every single day, I get to kind of insinuate myself um, into beautiful forests and waterfalls. And this is not only rejuvenating, but it's actually really an essential part of um, my aesthetic thinking and design inspiration. I, I can't live without nature. So it saddens me to think about what's already happening um, because of climate change. And also, what we're seeing now is going to become routine for um, children being born today, having to deal with these incredible uh, natural uh, disasters that are caused by climate change and ecosystems that they won't be able to cherish like I do. It's, it's heartbreaking. The second reason why we make this commitment is because we can. So we've covered this on the panel and I'll dive into it more. We have all the tools and the methods and components right now today to be able to meet the targets. And what's really exciting and um, surprising to me, actually, when I started this journey was how empowering using those tools can be and really um, liberating and, and fun. It's not a burden. In fact, architects using these tools, harnessing them, has a potential to create this kind of creative explosion. We're finding. Um, really a joy in discovery in using energy modeling that I never expected. And what we need as an industry and as a culture to make this massive commitment and change um, is really emotional. We need to do it because it's exciting and because um, it's generating a new type of architecture. That's the kind of paradigm shift we need. Um, unfortunately, it, it can't just be because it's the right thing to do. So my journey to this, um, I found myself at m approaching mid-career. Um, and I had achieved success in design excellence um, working for other firms. But I really knew that something was missing, this commitment to sustainability and the tools and expertise that I needed to be able to actually do that. And I always felt that sustainable design was a, just another important component of design excellence. And the leaders that I admired the most in our industry, um, I was worried about falling behind because I didn't have that commitment or that knowledge. So I made the leap and I did two things. First, I invested in training to teach, um, to learn how to do energy modeling and hydrothermal modeling, and to engage in the building science community 
um, to learn how to implement those things. And then I started my own practice, Colson in Duluth. And the mission of that was founded on the idea of, at a minimum, meeting the 2030 targets. Um, and more, really wanting to show that it's possible to do this without sacrificing the poetry of place, the sense of aesthetics, um, transparency and minimalist design, and also really importantly, not sacrificing a project budget. So we made the commitment in 2015, um, and our portfolio average um, is 89%. Uh, last year it was 100% um, uh, specifically for that year. And uh, this year it's 88%. So some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, communication um, about sustainability is really important. How you approach a new client or the public. Um, and I found that actually using the AI 2030 as the first step and kind of um, branching off from there is incredibly powerful. And this isn't something that I expected. We just happened upon this um, as a way of talking about sustainable design. Because of the weight of the AIA, that sustainability is part of a platform, um, and that they're asking all architects to make this commitment, that really means something to potential clients and the public when you explain why sustainability is important and what the 2030 challenge is. And also because it's neutral. So there's many, many different ways you can meet the target. Um, it's a big tent which invites all the different approaches to green building and green building practitioners into it. Um, and so it's very simple and welcoming message to the public and clients. From that, we can then slowly introduce them to more specific approaches, like Passive House, LEAD, Living Building Challenge, B3. Often those things I found uh, over trial and error <laughs> are, can be really intimidating or overwhelming or too technical if you leap right into those things. But if you make a slow introduction, starting with the AI 2030, it's a really powerful and helpful way to lead people to sustainable design. So talking about leading, I think it's critical that architects take the lead in two different things. One is educating clients. So over practice, we found that actually the best way to determine potential clients and projects um, is the way that most architects do. Um, and that is to find partners that um, are like-minded in the aesthetics and sense of style that you um, want to pursue, um, are giving you um, the flexibility to lead a team and um, a lead the priorities of a project, are strategic thinkers, but they don't necessarily have to be educated in green building or um, bring a mandate for um, sustainable design. We've found that we can bring those like-minded clients along um, slowly and gently to these really high levels of sustainable design. And that actually has been more productive way to be successful than to only seek out clients that already want green building. All of us have already talked about how important energy modeling is, and I'll get into kind of a specific design approach, but I can't stress enough how important energy modeling is for all architects to do. So um, we all do energy modeling at my firm, every day, for every project, for every phase, and right away. And um, this is a way to, as Chris said, really seamlessly integrate that into your design thinking. It's also a way for you to better lead your consultants and your team so that um, actually um, through this, I know a lot about um, mechanical and electrical design, uh, heating and cooling loads, ventilation CFM, 
And energy modeling teaches you that. It teaches you that language so that you can talk to your team about those things and kind of better focus the whole team on the options that are gonna work for the project as a whole, for the budget, and how what the priorities are for a project. But really the most exciting thing about energy modeling is the exploratory part of it. And so this is where this kind of creative explosion um, happens. And it's not something that I was expecting when I started this process. But when you do really detailed energy modeling and you have a very specific climate data set for your, your site and site characteristics, um, in our climate in particular, um, I found that the old assumptions about what is a green building and the rules that you're supposed to follow um, actually are really upended. And it's, it's only through pushing through energy modeling and asking questions, leaving yourself enough time to um, play with the tool, um, and for the architect designer to be doing that, um, it's really uh, uncharted territory that I'm, I'm really excited about, and I think it can lead to that paradigm shift where we're um, developing a whole new language for what architecture is and particularly what green building looks like. So my approach um, to sustainability um, and how I'm meeting the challenge is a conservation first one and really low tech and always keeping it simple constantly reminding myself and my team and everyone involved to keep things simple. So what we do is focus on the building envelope. Using energy modeling, we're testing all sorts of factors as we're designing. Passive solar heating, shading to prevent um, heat gain, super insulation, air tightness, heat recovery ventilation. And when you really focus on those elements and the site design, you can reduce your heating and cooling load by 90%. So this has huge energy implications, but it also has really wonderful design implications. You're eliminating ductwork. You can get super thin floor lines. You don't have equipment on your roofs. Um, all of these things that impact your sense of place. And so by doing that alone, those things alone, you can reduce your overall energy demand by 70 or 80% from the baseline to your targeted predicted EUI. So there you go. We're meeting 2030 now and in the near future um, just with that approach. So what's so interesting is that all of those things I mentioned can be invisible. You can seamlessly integrate those into the design um, without impacting the sense of place or the style that you or your client wants for a project. Green building does not have to cramp an architect's style. There is a lot of freedom in what we can do, even at this um, kind of rigorous and high performance level. So let's dive into some projects that we're doing that kind of best uh, um, explain this philosophy. MH House is a project in Duluth, Minnesota, has a 90% reduction in energy without any photovoltaics or renewable systems. So it's just focusing on the envelope, lighting, appliances, and very basic things. It's very transparent, has incredible views um, of the harbor and Canal Park. It's in the central hillside. This is uh, four units that are mixed use office um, and apartments. And the peak heating load is just 2,000 watts for the whole property. And that's really where we're seeing this huge reduction in energy and really not needing to do much more to get to the 90%. But ultimately, you don't know that it's green. Um, we're still focusing on the really interesting and exciting things we um, find about design and the context of the site and, and what the client is interested in. Disappear Retreat um, is a zero energy off-grid uh, tiny house 
It's um, designed for um, climates between Chicago uh, and Calgary. And the fun thing about energy modeling is you can toggle between all of these different climates and really understand the difference between Minneapolis and Duluth and how you might uh, select insulation or other things for a particular project. So this has photovoltaics, but it's really important to talk about what your um, energy reduction is before you even get to the renewables. Um, so before renewables, we're at 86%. And so then it's really easy to integrate photovoltaics and you see a thin film kind of camouflage on the south side of that structure that satisfies that remaining energy load, which is primarily for ventilation, plug loads, and a refrigerator. And that one just has a 100 watt peak heat load. The Bagley classroom in Duluth is a 1500 square foot assembly space before the photovoltaics, it has an 81% reduction in energy. And in cold Duluth, it only has a 3,000 watt peak heat load. So that's two hair dryers at minus 40 degrees, the worst case scenario um, that you're sizing your heating system for. Basically, in all of these projects, even in northern Minnesota, the heating system is never being used. And so that's where you get the cost puzzle. You're um, eliminating HVAC um, and the elements that you have to satisfy that 3,000 watts need to be very, very inexpensive and simple so that you can put that remaining money in the budget for things like triple pane glass and the insulation and air tightness. This is a renovation project in Duluth. So there's no photovoltaics. We're hitting an 82% reduction in energy compared to the um, existing building, adding um, super insulation in the form of Larson truss with cellulose to the outside, replacing all the windows with triple pane glass, um, uh, adding an air tightness um, membrane, and then um, basically removing the furnace um, and um, replacing it with a very small ventilation system that fits in a little tiny closet. This is a new project, uh, Water Street Residences. It's 10 single family homes on Lake Superior in downtown Duluth. You can see the level of transparency that we're able to achieve, um, large overhangs that provide shading and other shading um, solutions. Um, but what's interesting is solving the cost puzzle to be able to do this. So this project is uh, $250 a square foot. Um, and it's really understanding what triple pane glass costs, how to offset that with other things in the design, and having a client that um, al allows you to um, really think about what those priorities are and, and juggle the equation to get us to a, a pretty standard um, construction cost while hitting a 79% reduction in energy without any photovoltaics. And so these houses are super simple to operate um, and a very tiny heat load, 1,400 watts um, per house. And finally, um, jumping up in scale, um, we're doing a student housing project in Duluth, uh, 320 units. Um, this is a micro-dwelling concept um, that uh, all rooms uh, have views of the harbor. Um, and it's also modular, so it's being built in a factory and stacked. Um, and what's exciting here is we're integrating, um, so we're reducing the energy load again. Um, each dwelling only has a peak heat load of 90 watts. Um, and this type of project, um, the equations are different, obviously. We have um, uh, much more fluctuation in occupancy. Um, uh, that impacts the internal heat gains. Um, so it's a, a different uh, modeling scenario than some of my single family houses. Um, but every room has a view. Every module has these um, jewel-like bay windows that also have photovoltaics built in. So what's cool is the, the, this remaining energy load, um, each student will have a personal PV panel, basically, that they'll be able to track. Um, how they're doing and if they can live within that generation of that uh, panel um, over a year. So all of those projects had in common is energy modeling. 
You can't reduce the heating and cooling systems to that level um, and take this approach without doing pretty detailed energy modeling. But the good news is, it's really not that hard to learn. <laughs> I mean, I, I spent $5,000 in, in like a week of pretty um, simple classes to learn how to do it, and then it's just a matter of practicing and practicing. Um, and it's also really exciting, and you're learning things. So um, I say that all architects should be learning how to do energy modeling at some level, um, and that actually will really change your design thinking and be a kind of a renewal of, of our profession. Um, so thank you. So before we jump to uh, questions, I wanted to do a quick recap of the 2030 by the Numbers Report, which is the AIA 2030 Commitment Report they release on uh, national performance. It just came out yesterday, as Jesse mentioned, so uh, didn't make it into our presentation other than as a footnote. Our current status as, a, I, oh, and feel free to jump in. Uh, current status, we're at a 44% reduction nationally across our industry among firms that are reporting. Um, so not hitting the 70% uh, mark, but, um, but a little bit up from last year. And in Minnesota, we're doing, so what this uh, graphic, oh, it's a little washed out, what it's basically showing is that our code brings us to about 42% better than the baseline, as Jesse mentioned in his presentation, and we're actually at about 46, so on average, reporting firms in Minnesota are doing a little better than code. Um, but we could do better. This is our, so there's been a steady improvement uh, every year since reporting, but the trajectory that we're on does not get us to 100% carbon neutral by 2030. So I think what this image tells us is we need to step our game up a bit. And Carly just showed us how. And uh, there's some good news. There are steadily increasing numbers of firms who are reporting. So we were talking about this. If every firm represented in this room joined this commitment and reported in 2019, um, we would more than double the number of Minnesota firms reporting.